Hi, everyone, and welcome to our next segment of Moments with Mumila. I have the lovely Cindy Blackstock here with me. I'm super excited for our conversations today. And of course, as always, before we get started, the purpose of these conversations is to share Indigenous perspectives, experiences, and thoughts. These perspectives are not my own. I am looking to create awareness and support discussion amongst Indigenous peoples ourselves and among Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples outside of these Zoom segments. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the, that that perception of things are black and white. Yeah. As 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 a woman, as an indigenous person, as an Inuk, my whole as 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 half Inuk, half white, my whole life is gray. There is no such thing. I believe there is no such thing for me as black and white. It's not. And there are definitely things that are. So I take that back. There are, there are some key things to me that are black and white, but for the most part, my world is gray. My, my world is something that doesn't make sense because it has been built not to. And I think that, for example, even, and, and you had touched on it towards the beginning, in, our, in this day and age, when we use words like traditional, to me that doesn't look at the historical wrongdoings that the federal government did and continues to do uh, to me that it it erases that the fact that as indigenous peoples it was put into law that we were not to practice our culture we are not to uh, continue wearing regalia wearing headdresses for us it was things like shamanism and, and face tattoo tattooing in general uh, so and and people kind of have this weird and i'd be really interested to know what your experience is for for myself people legitimately sometimes wish i could just hand them a handbook here are the five things that you do to reach reconciliation yeah and i get questions all the time on things and i'm like i'm not a google search bar you can google that like i'm, I'm not here to just and again, like we are constantly trying, or it feels like we are just trying to win some weird argument in justifying why our lives are just as valuable, just as important. We deserve basic human rights, equal opportunity, and the right to self-determination. So can, can you talk about some of those, um, I guess like assumptions that people have where they really want you to put things into black and white, and it's it's so gray sometimes it's hard to talk about things like well even education i think is one that's an interesting conversation because we're talking about having a, a balance of what western society thinks is educating and and learning and things that we should know uh, and for many indigenous groups it's a very very holistic view it's a very and and it's learning at your own pace and it's not grading or saying by five you should know all your colors abcs one two threes kind of thing um it's it's a much in my view better approach <laughs> we're, we're, we because when we look at teachings through indigenous peoples it's oftentimes at the child's pace it's giving children more responsibility more respect including them uh, instead of saying, oh, you're too, it's too young to, what, like, it, it just seems so many conversations that we have are very, they're too simple, they're too black and white, we're not talking about the gray, and for Indigenous peoples within Canada, that's, it's our life, our life is gray a lot of the time, and, and I only say that to mean that it's, it's a blend, it's a mix, there is no right, wrong, yes or no, oftentimes those conversations should actually be the in-between areas that we don't talk about. Can you talk to some of those in-between areas or uh, even examples of, of people saying, well, isn't it just that or this? Why can't we just do one or the other kind of thing? Uh, can you talk about some of your gray experiences? Yeah, I think it's really interesting is that uh, one of my friends, uh, Terry Cross, who's a Native American uh, thinker, uh, works a lot with uh, Native American children and families. He talks about the difference between 
abundance and scarcity in worldviews. So things like um, uh, equality, uh, things like freedom, things like rights. Um, do we enter into this, that conversation thinking that there's a scarcity of those things? So if you have your rights recognized, that mean, does that mean that I get less? I.e. there's a finite amount of rights, of freedom and equality in the world? Um, or do we take the view that there's abundance, that there's enough for everyone? And the issue isn't the resources or the scarcity thereof, it's our relationship to them. And I think Indigenous peoples in general take the view that there is an abundance, that there isn't a trade-off in this, that you can be free and I can be free. You can be equal and I can be equal. And equality doesn't mean sameness. It means we have the ability to live distinctly as who we are. So I think that, you know, when we talk about um, this thing with, with broader Canadians, sometimes they get into that view that it's a trade-off. Somehow they're going to have to give something up in order for Indigenous peoples to have the basic human rights that we've been talking about. But that's not it. That's not the way it works, right? Is that rights are only rights when they're afforded to everyone. And with rights come responsibilities. If I have a right that's observed, my responsibility is towards other persons who are not receiving that right, right? I, I, we, there are basic fundamental values that are involved in this. So I think that's one area where people get it wrong, is they look at it black and white, when really it is about what kind of world do we want to raise our kids in? Is it one where every kid matters? Or is it one where only some kids matter? Keeping in mind that you might put, be in that group for now, but in the next generation, your kids might be out of that group, right? Is that the kind of world we want? Well, you, we need to ask those questions. And what I would say to non-Indigenous folks is a, is a couple of things. One is that what we're looking for are partners to address contemporary injustices. And part of that partnership is embracing your own responsibility to learn about your country. And, it's, and uh, we're not just expecting you to start from scratch. There's reports like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. There is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There is the Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Report. And um, if you're able to kind of get some bedrock on the history of the country, then we have a place for that conversation to happen. But if you're always relying on us to teach you about the basic history, then we can't get to a space where we can have the conversations about the gray. <laughs> Right? And um, that's not going to move us collectively forward. And so there is that responsibility. The other thing that I have done at the Caring Society is to try and take those grays and make them a bit more black and white. So with um, the Caring Society, we have seven free ways for people of any diversity to make a difference for First Nations kids in under two minutes. And there are ways that have been defined by First Nations communities. But what I um, realized years uh, ago is that I wasn't framing them in a way that people could understand them. I was using language like in grade one where you, only a few people understood. When what I really wanted was language that everybody could understand, right? So I started to read George Lakoff's work on Don't Think of an Elephant, a book that I recommend to everybody. It's, it's pretty cheap to get from paperback from your bookseller or um, going on to frameworks.org and realizing, thinking more about how things need to be framed, thinking more about how elders frame this. Like Elmer Crochane, a respected elder uh, from Saguin First Nation in Manitoba, someone who is a mentor to me, he would always call it loving justice. That was his word that was the closest, a phrase the closest to reconciliation. He called it loving justice. And when you think about loving justice for children, that's something that everyone can kind of relate to, right? But somehow we come up with these words, these, these, these words that seem pretty abstract and, well, how, what does this actually mean? And how do we get into this? But if we go back to explaining things simply, sometimes those simple explanations bring us closer to the real human spirit that we need to evoke. So framing, self-educating and ensuring that then you're now in a position as a non-indigenous person to have conversations 
that are in those areas of fluidity and gray. And don't try to get us in a place where we all have to think one way in order for there to be progress. I find that amazing in government. You probably see it in the House of Commons all the time. Well, the First Nations don't agree, so we can't do anything. And they're, they're sitting in the House of Commons, for Pete's sake, where you got um, largely, mostly white folks who don't agree, and yet they're somehow able to move the ball forward, right? Sometimes pretty clumsily so, but they, they, they expect things of us that they would never expect of themselves. Absolutely, and and that's um, hopefully one day I'm gonna roll my eyes so far back they're gonna get stuck in the back of my head. Yeah. Um, that is definitely what exactly what happens in the House of Commons. Um, where yeah, absolutely, and you don't have to look far to to see those kinds of things happening. We look at what's what, and we look at the pipeline, the divisiveness that is being created. Uh, within that because of political involvement and it's a such a layered and and in some ways a really complex conversation but really what we're looking at is we're giving large groups of indigenous peoples an impossible choice yeah. this is opportunity for a job which means money which means being able to feed your kids and pay rent how are how are we gonna provide an option between natural resource extraction and being able to provide for yourself and your family. It's an impossible choice. We, we, we pick who we love first. And that's just one example. And there are huge ones, there are small ones, and, and we see them all, all, all too often. Well, I think colonialism does is it brings it down to those dichotomous choices. Right. Right. So, for everyone else who's actually had a properly funded education that was uh, reflected and honored who they were, where their material was reflective of, of them and their family, where there wasn't the underfunding of services like water or the unbelievable high food prices paid in the northern communities were 33 bucks for a thing of orange juice, where everyone without those experiences is able to have a broader array of choices. Whereas for colonialism, it's constructed in a way that you either uh, get involved in resource development somehow, or you don't, and you preserve your culture, and no one else has to make that choice. That is a part of one of the biggest symbols of colonialism. It's one of the, la the red flags of colonialism, when people only have those two choices to choose from. It's not a choice. It's not. It's, it, it really... Oh. I can dive into a whole thing about that, but uh, you had mentioned uh, a, a couple of times now since we've been talking properly funded education. Can you expand on that? I think that's one of the biggest stereotypes that is out there is that, oh, you're indigenous, you got paid to go to school. You got, you got paid for your education. What are you whining about? What are you talking about inequality? The government just hands you things. I think that is one of the biggest, misconceptions at least that i have seen and experienced in my in my life can you talk about what you mean by properly funded education so we mentioned before that the federal government funds all public services on reserve that includes education and uh it includes the schools and what we know from the parliamentary budget officer the auditor general and others is that it's significantly underfunded uh, as much as half of what uh, other schools would get and one of the people who I think said this the best is uh, the respected and much missed uh, First Nations education, human rights uh, leaders, Shannon Kustachin, who is from the Attawapiskat First Nation. And uh, her school uh, was built on top of a diesel fuel lung, uh, leak. 30,000 gallons of diesel was below her school. And it was making people sick. So they closed the school, the government of Canada, then they brought portable trailers up to James Bay and put them on the playground of that contaminated school. They told the kids this is only temporary. But Shannon, uh, Shannon went from kindergarten to grade eight in those same portables and they got more and more run down. There was ice buildup on the insides, there was rodent infestations, there was no hallways in the school. It would be regularly minus 40 outside, so you had to bundle up to go to your next class. And as Shannon said, kids were losing hope at grade four and dropping out. 
So she wanted to do something about it because she said, school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this. And she saw the leadership of her community pleading with Canada for a school, but that wasn't enough to convince the Canadian government. So she got a YouTube video and she went around her, uh, the, the portables and took pictures of them and sent out a YouTube video inviting non-Indigenous kids to join her in the fight for a proper school. And they did, they started to send letters. In fact, more letters arrived at Indian Affairs thanks to Shannon Kustachin's leadership and the leadership of other youth in Attawapiskat than ever before on any issue. Um, but that even that wasn't enough pressure. So she come, what they do is, uh, Shannon's about to graduate from grade eight and they canceled their, they had fundraised for a grade eight graduation, but they canceled their grade eight graduation and used the money to send Shannon and two other youth from Attawapiskat down to meet with the Minister of Indian Affairs to she demand to school. Grade eight. Grade eight. Grade eight. Wow. So she flies to Ottawa and she's meeting with the Minister of Indian Affairs and he's looking at, a, you know, doing whatever he's doing, pointing out how big his office is. And she said, yeah, I wish our school was as nice as your office. And she, and she said, are you going to give us a school or not? And he said, no, we can't afford it. And she said, I don't believe you. And school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this and I will never give up. And true to her word, she kept on telling everyone around Canada and indeed around the world about the inequities and the hardships and what that meant for First Nations students. And sadly, when she was 13, she wanted to go to uh, university to be a human rights lawyer for the education rights. So she knew she couldn't go to the underfunded high school in her community and be able to go to university. So she goes hundreds of miles away to a school in New Lister. And it was on her way back to school one day where she was killed in an automobile accident at the age of 15. She never saw the school that eventually was built in Attawapiskat, and she, uh, kids like her are still fighting for equity in education because they wanna grow up and be someone important and also be who they are. They shouldn't have to sacrifice who they are in that process. So yeah, Shannon's dream is still unfulfilled by the Canadian government. Still, and it's, I hope that with, how much we have access to everything going on in the moment right now. <laughs> I think it's it's a little bit much how, I think, what's the saying, 10, 10 seconds of fame or something like that. I think we're down to one or half a second of very important topics that just come and go so quickly. And I I really hope we're at a turning point in Canada where because we have access to even these kinds of conversations that we're starting to have more support and more people willing to walk alongside us, more people willing to step forward because what what we are seeing, and you know, I, I think of uh, now individuals like Autumn who travels internationally advocating for, for water, for the right to water, that we are having youth looking around and saying, these grown-ups aren't taking care of what they need to, they're not taking care of us, I, I now feel the need to to step in and, and use my voice. And it's something that is incredibly powerful. But I hope it is also a realization for Canadians to say, holy, why aren't we supporting individuals in basic human rights, in equality, in justice? And, and I think that's a turning point that we're starting to see more so. But we are also seeing all of the the negativity and and the trolling and the you it, if you ever question if you ever ever question whether there is racism in Canada or not all you need to do is go on Facebook or Twitter yeah. or and all you need to do is look at the comment section we still very clearly have have an issue with differences and i think that unfortunately in and and it's still i can't the more the longer i'm in this position and and it was a quick one it was a quick decision if you asked me exactly a year ago uh if i saw myself exactly where i am a year later i would laugh at you and say 
politics? Ew. <laughs> I don't want to be involved in, leave me out of that. And then the opportunity came along. And I think for, for Indigenous peoples like us, and, and I think even privilege for, there was quite a while where even saying white privilege was too much for a lot of people. And I think we're starting to get comfortable with that idea. And I think there are so many different levels of privilege. I have privilege 100%. I I get to advocate for Inuit, for Nunavut on a federal level that, that comes along with a lot of privileges. I can do that, fortunately. <laughs> there are so many barriers, even in becoming an MP, uh, that people don't realize. And it, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly eye-opening for myself to see really how ingrained and and the foundation of what we call Canada is built on racism on discrimination on the idea that one way of living is better than another or is is higher or is is more for whatever reason uh, I'm just I'm looking at our time I'm really really enjoying this conversation and I don't want it to stop but we have been talking for yeah. <laughs> quite a while and and that's perfectly fine i'm thinking maybe i'll i'll chunk up this one and and we'll put it out in segments maybe but we'll all see. that means is that we get to have another conversation some and, and yeah. then another time you know great and and just to wrap up i think uh, to leave on a positive note we can talk to the future and talk to what other people how people can contribute so for indigenous children in looking towards the future however far you want to look what are some some of the hopes that you have some of the changes they, you would like to see that they the kids like autumn and kids like shannon no longer have to spend their childhoods fighting for clean water and, cl and a good education that we decide as a society that enough is enough and at culturally based equity and public services for first nations metis and inuit children is a is, is a of course item I always talk about when we cross, finally at some point we're gonna cross a threshold where that type of discrimination becomes absolutely intolerable to the Canadian consciousness. And when we're on the other side, we're gonna be asking, how did we ever put up with that? And uh, I want us to remember the normalization, how much normal it was and how dangerous that was and how important it is that we don't normalize that. That's one of my dreams. And the other um, is that we enter into a society we start dialoguing about differences an asset instead of something that somehow creates it that is equated with trouble that we understand that um like our ancestors have said that no one people no one person had all the answers it was in our interdependence in the way that we related to one another and to the land that really would define the levels of humanity the best of humanity that we could achieve together and I'd like to see First Nations, Métis and Inuit children being a valued part of that constellation, that they are valuable because of who they are. And the other thing I'd like is for them not to feel, not to be playing that who's a real Indian game in their own head. They are sacred and special. That identity they have was gifted to them by something far more powerful than any human being around them. It was gifted to them by their ancestors. They feel it in their spirit and they feel it in their heart and that we need to honor them for who they are and embrace that not question it not challenge it not apply for status cards that that is something that's respected and honored going forward and people can make a difference by that seven ways to make a difference and uh going on to our website fncaringsociety.com it really is that easy and everything is free because we won't charge people uh who want to make a difference in society we want you because of who you are not because of how much you carry in your wallet i'm just writing the website over here for myself oh great so have to take a look um yes absolutely and i really hope that listeners and viewers are really grasping what we're talking about and that we are talking about we are talking about equality for for children for kids for youth and uh, I, it's it's so powerful and amazing but at the same time it's like why are we here in this day and age 
yeah. fighting still, fighting, fighting, fighting. And and it's 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 a it's amazing, but it's also unfortunate in a way that it, it needs to happen. And yeah. I th- I think we are moving into a better place. I think we are. I think we're we're getting after talking about truth and reconciliation for, for a number of years, I think we're moving we're moving towards truth. And I think we're we're getting there. Yeah. Um in, in some ways. One definitely we're we're getting there in some ways. Uh, what about yourself? What would you like to see for, for your future? What are there some things that you hope to be able to to do? Well, I've I honestly feel so blessed in my lifetime already to have the opportunity to work in the company of others, and by others I mean those who came long before I did, uh, to really try to break the chains of the racial discrimination that First Nations children are experiencing, and to live long enough to start to see how when they're given an equal opportunity from Jordan's principle, or uh, through Shannon's advocacy with the opening of other schools, the amazing things that are starting to unfold for those kids. What an absolute blessing. I, I would hope that we would, you know, be able to see the federal government finally acknowledges racially discriminating against kids across all areas and not, not talk about, oh, but we made historic investments, but actually sit with that. And then com- in a way that compels them into action, into ending it. Um, but I don't know if that was uh, what thing that the ancestors had plotted out for me. I just know that I've been really blessed to be a part of this journey. And uh, I have so much faith in those young people like Autumn and others uh, to be able to carry this torch and do something even different, much more extraordinary than I can ever imagine. I just would love to see that their gifts are, are, are in ways where their fundamental human rights are already acknowledged that they no longer have to spend their childhoods fighting for the basics. Um, Because I just think those gifts they have are just so extraordinary and I just love to see them focused on whatever the world could could bring to them. Absolutely, hopefully in in our lifetimes at least we'll be able to see some of those things start to change. It would be very heartbreaking to leave the world in a place that we're in a very similar place we found it in, if that makes sense. And I think I love working with youth and that and and children keep you so grounded and, and humble in knowing and being reminded constantly of what the important things are in life. And that's taking care of ourselves, helping taking care of others and, and spending time supporting one another with our with our loved ones. And jumping into mud puddles with both feet. Oh, jumping into mud puddles <laughs> with both feet. I love it. Like it's it's such a nice um, our, our children are so important and, and the next generations that's why I do what I do I can't imagine a life where my children or grandchildren or great grandchildren or great 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 grandchildren are still fighting for the same things that we're sitting here talking about and I think it's it's something that is shifting and, and changing and something that's so empowering uh, the most productive points of my life were with youth the times I grew the most the times I I fought the hardest the times I felt like oh I'm so done with with everything it was it's youth that always pulled me back and youth and and it's kind of weird I think for myself to say that out loud because I am 26 but I think for a lot of indigenous peoples unfortunately we're forced to grow up and figure things out a lot more quickly than other people would imagine, which is ironic in a way when you look at the education system and when you look at the situations that we are put in. We are very <laughs> resourceful, knowledgeable, creative, because we, we have to be to an extent as well. And, and I think that providing equality and justice is just feeding into individuals, families, and communities that have such amazing potential contributions to make for the rest of us. And just imagine a a Canada like that. Imagine a 
Canada with equality for children to to grow and achieve dreams that they want to, regardless of what it is. Oh, so <laughs> even yeah. just that, it's like there's there's hope. We have hope. We have strength. There, we'll we'll get there. We are, uh, and you know, a huge thanks to the ancestors who came before us, because you and I would not be standing where we were if not for them. Absolutely. And um, I am. I my my one hope is that I make a, as half a good of ancestor as they were to us. I totally agree and totally share that same goal. I really, really appreciated all of really your time nice today. You. It was so, so much fun. Oh, it was so, so nice to connect. And um, when I had asked one of my staff to see if you'd be interested, you know, I had done a little bit of research. Uh, to be very honest, I didn't know much about you until... Yeah. A couple of weeks ago and once I started looking I was like oh my gosh all this all this power, powerful things you are working on and have worked on and uh, changing I, I think we need to learn how to break a little bit more we're here trying to change the lives and to an extent we're getting there and yeah. and it'll it'll get better awesome thank you so much again for your time I really really appreciate it be safe and have a good trip back home yes thank you so much bye-bye